Well, good morning. As I said in the first service, this is um, there's no real training for pastors to uh, deal with situations like this, where you have to get up and you have to preach a sermon after the loss of somebody that's been so significant in the church. And so we're just going to muddle through this morning. I cried my way through the first service and probably will do so again this one. So, uh, but we're in a time of mourning. We've lost somebody that's been important, somebody who's had uh, not just an impact on, on uh, a few people, but on an impact on a lot of people. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul and, and stuff, but um, we're going to just talk about mourning. But I just wanted to share. It's like a week from now, we're going to be celebrating Christmas, a time when we're supposed to be happy and joyous, a time that is a celebration of the Savior of the world being born into this world in order to bring us life. Death brought sin into the world. Jesus brought life back to us. And so next week, we're going to celebrate that, and we're going to be happy, and we're going to, we're going to sing praises to the Lord because of what he has done. But this week, we're going to mourn because we've lost somebody that's been important and significant. And it's okay, too. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I wanted to share a story. I shared this story in the first service. Um, so I figured I probably should share it this service as well. Uh, many years ago, 24 years ago, I don't really remember exactly what year it was, 92, 91, somewhere in there, um, my family has lived in the house that Lisa and I own since 1972. When my parents first moved into that house, it was an empty field there. Well, then the church that was here at the time built the house there. And so, and they lived, the pastor of the church at that time lived in that house. And, but they grew, and they outgrew this building, and so they sold this building. And so they sold it to this other church, but they also sold the house. And so the church was going to be the church, but the pastor of the church was going to move into that house. And so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting always to uh, get new neighbors anyway, but here's a pastor, you know, a spiritual leader, and moving into your next door, and, you're, and you kind of think, wonder, oh, I'm living next to the, a pastor, you know, what's that going to be like? Well... You know, when, think about when you have a new neighbor move in and you want to greet them and you want to welcome to the neighborhood. You want to take them a plate of cookies and, and just say, welcome, glad to have you here. Well, that's not what happened. It is not. We at the time had a German shepherd. Her name was Tiffany. And Tiffany was about 70, 75 pounds. Um, and for the most part, she was a pretty good dog. Uh, she would stay with me, so I would often talk times go out into the neighborhood and stuff, and she would always be with me. She had one flaw, and that flaw was that she had never been socialized to other animals, and so she hated other animals. As a matter of fact, most of the time, she saw them as lunch, okay? And so we're uh, out, Tiffany and I are out in the, the yard, the front yard one day, and the new family next door are moving in. You know, and it was great to see, the, see all the people from the church who were helping Paul and Joyce move into their house. Well, nobody warned me, didn't, didn't know this, and all of a sudden, they have a little dog. This little thing, it was probably about this big. I mean, it's a little toy poodle. Um, my wife reminded me that uh, their dog's name was Muffin. <laughs> you already know where this is going. My dog thought muffin was lunch. Uh, so Tiffany takes off, uh, and because they were moving furniture into the house, all the doors were open. Well, muffin runs into the house, and my dog goes right in with it. And so this is my introduction to Paul and Joyce. It's pulling my dog off of theirs. Um, thankfully, muffin got behind the couch, and my dog was too big. Couldn't get to it, so... It could have it turned out a whole lot worse than it did. Um, but Paul and Joyce were so gracious, so gracious, uh, 
Um, you know, I, I was thinking, oh, I got to move out of the neighborhood now. It's like, oh, I'm insulting the pastor. You know, my dog is going to kill their dog. You know, all these things are running through my head. And it's like embarrassing, but they were just so gracious to us. And uh, over the years, Paul and I became friends. And, and that was probably about eight years before Lisa and I started attending this church. Um, because we'd be out in the yard, we'd be working, you know, and, and I'd know it would be, it's going to take me an hour to get my yard work done. But I got to be honest, Paul would often increase that amount of time. <laughs> because we would just start talking. And uh, we would stand out of the yard and sometimes talking for 45 minutes an hour. And uh, my yard work would then have to get delayed and stuff. But um, that's just kind of who Paul was, you know. It's just who he was. He just, he loved people and he loved talking with people. And um, because of that, he's just had such a huge impact on all of us. Um, over this next few days, we'll share more stories about Paul. You'll hear other things. Um, some will be funny, some not so funny. Um, but that's, that's what it takes when we're mourning, when we're grieving for the loss of somebody. It takes a lot of tears, a lot of pain in our heart. But it also takes the stories. The stories help. It helps us to work through that sadness and that grief. And today my message is about just, it's okay for us to grieve. It's okay for us to feel the sadness. Um, during the first service, my friend Dave Kelly shared a, a, a verse, which was actually a part of my, my notes. Um, I'm not sure why Dave didn't share it this service. I'm a slacker. Um, but uh, this was a passage that he shared out of Ecclesiastes, uh, and you probably recognize it. Uh, in verse 1, it says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. And in verse 4, it goes on to say, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And there will come a time, soon probably, where we can laugh and we will probably dance. But today is a day of weeping and mourning. We've lost somebody. And we didn't lose somebody that wasn't significant. We didn't lose somebody that... that had only been coming to, the, to this church and been part of this family for a short period of time. We've lost somebody that founded this church. Who we are as a church is a direct result of who Pastor Paul was as a man of God. Okay? And who we become as a church is the legacy that we carry on from Pastor Paul. It's a term that Tola used, legacy. That's another term that... <laughs> And they, between the two of them, they did most of my sermon this morning, so I skipped about half of it anyway. Our hearts are hurting. Our hearts are sad. But if we look at this scripture, then we've got to know that there is a time when it's appropriate to mourn. There is a time that it is appropriate for us to, to weep and cry. And there's a time for us to move on from that. But right now is the time for us to cry. Now, some of you might be like, have grown up like I did. Very, I grew up in a family that um, my father never really showed much emotion. Uh, I grew up not showing much emotion. I never, I never cried um, until God did something in me about 20 years ago. But I just didn't cry. I didn't even cry at my own grandmother's funeral. Okay. But now, I can't help it. And it's okay. It really is okay for us to cry and to mourn. When we lose somebody that's important, that, that touches our heart, it, it, it hurts. It is painful. It causes damage to us. And it's okay, okay for us to cry and mourn for that. As uh, many of you know, I've been a psychotherapist for 30 years. I have dealt with people who've struggled with mourning and who haven't, who instead of feeling the pain and allowing the pain to be there and, and to work it through, they've kind of stuffed it down. Well, the problem is and then they suffer the sadness and the pain for years, for years. I knew a, a lady that I worked with a few years ago that um, she had uh, lost a brother in a, in a particular situation. It was a, a, in actually in a crime. And 
30 years later, she was still mourning her brother. Every time she thought about her brother, she would, it would just bring tears to her eyes and cry. Just such sadness. But if we do mourning right, if we do grieving the way God really intended for us to do it, it won't last that long. And soon we will be able to laugh and dance again. Okay? So my job today is to help us to look at what is that? What does that look like? How do we do that? Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's a difficult task. It's a scary thing because, let's, let's face it, some of us don't want to expose ourselves by crying. But I'm telling you that it's okay. So in another passage uh, that I wanted to share with you real briefly, um, this is out of John chapter 11. And so, and this is, if you, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, but this is a story about Lazarus. And if you remember the story, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus and he died. And so Jesus was coming uh, to uh, Bethany at, the, at that point to, to be with the family. He knew what he was going to do, um, but nobody else did at that point. Uh, so let me read that real quickly. This is uh, John 11, uh, verse, starting in verse 24. Um, and Jesus said, your brother will rise again. He's saying this to Martha. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that is the truth. The Lord is the resurrection and the life. He came into the world, he was born into this world in order to restore life to us. Sin took it away and Jesus brought it back. But he goes on, this is a little farther down, verse 33, and he says, therefore, when Jesus saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see and Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now he knew when he came into this situation, if you read scripture clearly, he, he knew going in what he was going to do. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that there was no real reason for them to be crying and weeping because he knew he was going to raise him up and that their grief would be taken away. He knew that. And yet here is a God who feels the anguish of his people and weeps with them. It is an honor to serve a God who weeps with us. Our God knows our anguish. And though God is pleased to have Pastor Paul join him for eternity in heaven, we're not. We're not. I get a little tired of Christian uh, sayings and, and platitudes sometimes. We can say the, the, the nice spiritual thing. And, and if you've said this, I'm not, I'm not trying to insult you, but I've got to be honest, it's not where I'm at at the moment. You've probably heard it said, oh, well, he's in a better place. Oh, we'll see him again. But the reality is, I want him here now. I wasn't ready to let him go. He was having such an impact on everybody's hearts and their lives, and I wasn't ready. We're, we're, we as a church weren't ready to let him go. And you know what? God understands that. God understands our anguish. He understands the pain that we have in our hearts. And he wouldn't take that from us. He wouldn't tell us, that, oh, you know what, he's in a better place, so there's no reason to grieve. God wouldn't do that. Clearly, Jesus didn't do that. He saw the anguish of Martha and Mary and the people that were there for the, the death of Lazarus. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he wept. God weeps with us. He does. We got a little bit of a later start this morning, um, the second service, because people were still hanging around and 
um, just connecting. And so we're going to, I'm going to go on for a couple more minutes, but then we're going to as well just kind of hang around. Um, as I was thinking of all this and just trying to deal with it, uh, it just, it struck me that, that Paul had one more, I want to say one more, but the truth is he probably has many more lessons that we're, we're probably going to learn from his life. But this is another lesson. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Okay, while we were still sinners. I mean, that's, that's the hope of the gospel, right? That is awesome. But Paul, Pastor Paul, fell in love with this God who saved him so much. He fell in love with this God that he gave his life and all the hopes and the dreams that he might have had before, he gave them up to become all that God wanted him to be. And this is his legacy because of that. Paul grew up, and many of you know, he grew up on a, on a ranch in Wyoming. He could have been a, a rancher in Wyoming and had a major impact on cows. <laughs> right? Paul went to, to college, uh, eventually got into uh, chemistry and biochemistry and was at the research center at, at the CU Med Center. Um, was having an impact there as well, you know, and he could have been the one that discovered, you know, the greatest cure for cancer. Don't know. Because he felt a call from God to be something different. And he started reaching out to a few street people that were near where he and Joyce were living. And out of that grew Living Water Church. There's a story about Living Water Church that, that a few people have heard me tell, but I'm going to tell it again because it's such an impacting story. Years ago, I worked downtown, and I would take a bus from our house to downtown, and it uh, went through this neighborhood where, real close to where I was working, and I saw this church building. It was kind of in a storefront, and I saw the name of this church across there, and I thought, that is the coolest name for a church I ever saw. This was back in 1986. The church was called Living Water Church. And I was determined in my heart, I need to go there someday. That just sounds like such a cool church, you know. Um, never made it. Never went there. Um, and God saw fit to move that church here. <laughs> right? Okay, so God wanted Paul to have such an impact on my life that he didn't necessarily get me there because I didn't go. So he moved the church here and put him right next door to me. Right? I'm just saying. If I'd have just obeyed God and gone to the first, the first time, you know, who knows what might have happened. Um, but I'm just, I'm just struck with the, the impact that one person can have. Now, there's a, there's a verse... In Romans 8.13, let me find it real quick. Oh, I think I have it on. We skip down, Amy. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Okay? See that. For if you live according to the sinful nature, the sinful desires that we all have inside of us, you will die. And we're not talking about just the physical death. We're talking about eternal death in hell. But if by the Spirit, because we don't do this on our own, you put that to death, the misdeeds and the desires of your, of your flesh, you will live. Now, Pastor Paul is one of the best examples I've ever seen of this. Paul set aside the, the things of his flesh in order to become what God intended for him to become which is a man serving the Lord with his whole heart and his whole life. And he had such an impact on so many people because he was able to do that. Now, as I said in the first service, Paul would never say that he was an extraordinary man. He would never say that he was special. He always would have said, I'm just, just an ordinary person, just like everybody else. And knowing Pastor Paul, I know that there's not an entire truth to that that there was some special things about Paul. He was just an awesome guy. But there's the other side is absolutely true as well. Because Paul did nothing that the rest of us can't do as well. 
which is nail our flesh to the cross, all of our sinful desires, and become and live out the life that God has intended for us. That's the example of Paul's life. That's what he lived and exemplified more than anything else in his life, was how a common person, any one of us, can set aside our sinful desires and take up life in Christ. And because of that, that's the example we will live with. So my challenge to you then is to begin thinking of Paul, but think about the example that Paul is and has become for us. We're never ready for death, even when we think we are. It has such an impact on us. But we as a church, we're not just a church. This is just not just a building. A church is a family. And this family has lost somebody, somebody significant. I tell stories up here about Paul um, because it's my way of remembering him. It's my way of dealing with the sadness that I feel in my heart. So I'm going to end this. Kirsten's going to bring the worship team up here. And they're just going to play for a little bit. But here's what I want you to do. And we're going to be for a little bit. So, Sue, you can just take your seat. You can just, we'll be here for a minute. For the next 10, 15, 20, I don't care, 30 minutes, we're just going to love on one another. When people are mourning and they don't, know how to deal with the sadness, they, one of two things happens. They either stuff it and they don't deal with it, or it comes out in bad ways and we're rude and we're mean and we're short-tempered. But so we're going to do it better, okay? And we're just going to spend some time with one another. And you can share stories with each other. You can hug on each other. I noticed this morning, even as people were coming in and as hugging people, it's like normally I hug people, but this morning I hugged people. It was different. And it's because my heart is so sad. So as uh, the worship team plays for us, let's just gather together with the people around you. Get up and move around and, 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 and just mourn with one another. Cry with one another. Share stories about Pastor Paul with one another.